G'day everyone, welcome back to another video on the channel. So yes, if you're wondering, I have emotionally recovered from that grand final. Uh, geez, what a, what a bloodbath it was. But once again, congratulations to the Lions for being the premiers of 2024. As we now shift our attention into one of the fan favorite videos always every single year. I'm gonna be reacting to my season predictions from when I did them back in March. Gonna be going through my ladder predictions and also reacting to a few bold calls I did make as well. Now, we like to be pretty competitive with the uh, ladder predictions. We do a point system each and every year, basically uh, pretty much like a golf system. The lower the score, the better. Where, let's say I tip the Sydney Swans in fourth place. It's a three-point difference. You do that for every single team you predicted, and the lower score, the better. So, in 2022, we got 56 points. And then last year, we had an absolute stinker. We got 82 points. So, hoping for this year when we react to my predictions today, meet in the middle at least, get better than what we did last year. Uh, but yeah, off the top of my head, there were a few calls that I felt were, were pretty spot on, but there were a few blunders, just like everybody's predictions uh, at the start of the season. So let's get into it, shall we? We'll pop on the headphones and react to my season predictions. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you do go on to enjoy today's video. Let's get straight into it. We start off with hey, the 18th first and 18th, the West Coast Eagles. Okay, so 18th place, the West Coast Eagles, and in the end, they did not finish as the Wooden Spooners. That's a few years in a row now where I've literally gotten the Wooden Spoon to tip incorrect every single time. I just cannot nail it. Uh, the Eagles ended up finishing 16th, so it is a two-point difference to kick off the score for the reactions video. Uh, yeah, the Eagles expected we're going to be bottom four this year. I felt maybe they could make a push, and how about that? They had some uh, massive scalps and uh, some breakout plays to Harley Reid. Very good first year. Brady Hoff loved his season uh, in defense, of course, as well. Also, Ruben Jimby, especially the second half of the year, thought he made some great progress uh, developing as that halfback type. Throughout games this season, they're able to, yeah, really get on top of clearances, uh, especially with that upset win over the Demons. And also, uh, the Derby win over Fremantle was sensational as well. So, how are they going to go next year? I feel like they could push up a little bit, but... As expected, West Coast are always going to be in that bottom three, bottom four range, but did now the wooden spoon tip, they end up finishing in 16th. I'm going with Richmond. This is... Okay, so the Tigers in 17th, and bang, I'll definitely take that one. Uh, one of my ball calls, I do remember, I had a feeling that the Tigers would finish below North Melbourne, and that certainly was the case in the end, and... Oh, I just wasn't bold enough or bullish enough or had the balls to put uh, the Tigers for the wooden spoon. And I could really see a world and it ended up happening. Uh, but let's be real here. The Tigers had a horror run of injuries. And if they had a fully fit list for the most for the majority of the season, they probably would have easily gotten a lot more than just two wins for the year. Uh, but yeah, they're just in the current stage of turning over their list. Uh, some stars are retiring and all that. Uh, had a lot of young players play as well. And this sort of the same thing is going to be happening uh, next year with Rioli and also Baker and Shea Bolton on the out of two. But just couldn't really strike much consistency. They started off the year, felt quite okay. Played some good patches of football. But uh, yeah, they're just uh, a yeah, lack of exposure with a lot of young players out there. So still aside in uh, a rebuilding phase of Tigers. Ended up being the wooden spooners, but I had them in 17th. So only just a one point difference. And now for 16th, I do have North Melbourne. Okay, so pretty vanilla prediction there. North Melbourne 16th, and in the end, they finished in 17th. So I've jumbled up a little bit of the bottom three, but I have gotten the bottom three correct at least. So that's a positive. Uh, just the one point difference, the Kangas ended up finishing in 17th. And yeah, plenty of good and bad, I think, for North Melbourne. They had a bit of a horror patch here and there throughout most of the season. Uh, we're able to have a, a pretty decent patch of football, though, um, after the bye. They had that, that, uh, they had that close loss against Collingwood, where they really should have won. Close loss against the Demons a wee bit, too. Uh, but Harry Sheasel went to another level this season, which I, I love to see. Charlie Comber moving defence. Looks like a great move. Uh, Nick Larkey, another pretty solid season from himself, too. And not only myself, but there were, for sure, a lot of North Melbourne supporters questioning how would Tristan Cherry go this year. Smashed it. One of the most improved players in the competition. Could have made the All-Australian. So there are plenty of positives, I think, for North Melbourne. Going to hopefully smash another uh, good-looking draft this off-season, too. And could they finally push out of the bottom four? But, yeah, North Melbourne ended up finishing 17th, and I had them 16th, so a one-point difference. And to round out the bottom four in 15th, I'm going with Hawthorne. Ah, oh, dearie me. Well, there's the first blunder of the Hawks in 15th, and you know what does annoy me a little bit? I did say in that uh, season predictions video, I did say 
I feel like North, uh, not North, sorry, Hawthorne would start off the season a bit meh, and that's exactly what happened. They started off 0-5, I'm pretty sure it is, and they finally got their first win over North Melbourne. But I feel like they have a bit of a resurgence um, in the second half of the year. Why didn't I put them higher up the ladder then, for Christ's sake? One of the most improved teams in the competition this year. One of the most enjoyable sides to watch in 2024 with the brand they played. Uh, they just built cohesion as the as the weeks grew on. Some of the young players had some massive seasons. Dan Brosio, one of the recruits of the year. Ginevan and Watson in the forward half were electric. Also, as the season wore on, they became one of the best grand level sides in the competition. Their brand really did stack up with the best. They won a final and they could have won that one against Port Adelaide. They were a kick away from a prelim final where many people had them for the bottom four, including myself. But there were, I feel, uh, I do remember a small contingency that did have Hawthorne back in the eight this year. So kudos if you were one of those individuals. But yeah, still a bit of a bad prediction. I did feel that rise up a bit this year, but I should have been more bullish. Ended up making finals. So in the end, it is a eight point difference given I had them in 15th and they ended up finishing in seventh. 14th position, I'm going with the Western Bulldogs. It's uh, geez, another shocker there. So Bulldogs 14th ended up finishing in sixth place. So add another eight points to the score. Uh, yeah, not a good call from myself there. I just had a lot of doubts heading into this season for the Dogs. They started off pretty ordinary, to be fair, uh, but they really got the, um, yeah, really got uh, going uh, as the weeks did grow on. Just had doubts about Luke Beveridge and a bit of the list to Ken show. Just so many inconsistencies, this Bulldog side. Uh, but yeah, we, we did see some uh, really good performances from a lot of different players. Not just Bontepelli, but Trelaw had a career best year. Roy Lobb's move into defence the second half of the year was a game-changing one. Yeah, I felt uh, without Roy Lobb, they probably would have lost that Elam final by 70-plus points. Bailey Dow had another All-Australian calibre year. Uh, Hugo Hagen went to the next level felt this season too. So I have to hold my hands up. A pretty naive prediction from me in the end. You just look at that dog side. It's talented. And I just can't be putting in the future a Bulldog side making 14th. So yeah, bad call from me in the end. An eight-point difference. Moving on to 13th place. I'm going with the Fremantle Dockers. I must... Okay, so Fremantle in 13th. And yeah, I could have put them a little bit higher. There was, there was still a bit of that... Deep feeling inside me at the start of the year, feeling like, yeah, they, they definitely are a final smoky, the Dockers. And let's be real, they really should have made uh, t the finals this year. Uh, it was crazy how they dropped, uh, what was it, three of their last four games. Pretty much choked them. They just didn't stand up in key moments. And they ended up finishing ninth. So it is, in the end, just the three-point difference. Apologies, sorry, they ended up finishing tenth, not ninth. So, yeah. 10th place, so three-point difference. They started off the season really well. I'm pretty sure they won uh, the first three games. And they only made finals two seasons ago, let's remember. It is still a very talented team, uh, this Fremantle side. And you look at that young core and you think, geez, it's some of the best in the competition. I felt their midfield, um, especially in the first half of the year, looked really deadly. Caleb Strong started like a house on fire. Brayshaw really got his game going the second half of the year. And so did Hardy Young, uh, one of the more damaging users inside 50. So I feel like Fremantle will learn a lot off this season. Um, definitely disappointing on how they finished off the year. But yeah, they've just got so much talent across the ground. Uh, Jai Miss, I felt like he'd be the guy to really lift them once again. But it was more of Josh Tracy. He had an outstanding season. I think he kicked uh, pretty much nearly or over 50 goals. Most likely going to get Shea Bolton too. So I feel like uh, the only way is up potentially for this free mental side. Could they be top four Smokey heading into next year? But in the end, sort of downplayed them having them 13th as they ended up finishing 10th and could have finished a lot higher given they were top four throughout multiple stages of this season. Another big call, the Melbourne Football Club. Okay, bang. This is probably my first good call um, of this video, oh, to be fair. I, I did guess the, the bottom three creeks, so that is technically a good call. But I, I call this the best call so far, given, um, yeah, there was a lot of doubt uh, heading into this season for Melbourne. And to be fair, it wasn't just me. A lot of people had them missing the eight, but it just felt right. Don't mean that in a negative way, um, but it just simply did. Uh, with the fallout they had in the off-season, and I just felt... Will their profile, will their team stack up in 2024? There was just multiple doubts. Uh, Max Gorn had a career best year, to be fair, though. Uh, but let's be real here. They were really hindered with that Petrarca injury and Brayshaw also retiring, too, at the start of the year. Felt their depth really got exposed this season, too. The Demons, once Petrarca went down, they had to throw Trent Rivers as basically a full-time midfielder for the first time in his career. Players like Christian Salem and Jake Bowie were in and out of the team with injury as well. And Melbourne, the past few years, have always been regarded with that really strong contest side. Uh, you know, long down the line sort of game style, but also able to really win it well in and under and uh, execute well off the turnover. But they just got 
beaten in their own strengths this year. Uh, they became a pretty average turnover team, the numbers and also the contested stuff uh, this year, the Demons, and just look like, honestly, a very average side. So Melbourne ended up finishing in the end 14th, so they went worse than what I thought. It's a two-point difference, but still a pretty solid prediction for myself, so I'll take that. And now for 11th place, I'm going with the Essendon Bombers. Okay, bang on prediction. We'll definitely take that. It's always a good video when you at least get one team spot on and the Bombers did end up finishing in 11th place. And I was bullish on the Bombers heading into this season. I felt that they'd, they'd rise up the ladder. I did, I did remember a handful of people. A lot of people had them for the bottom four, but I just felt they're a lot better of a team than that. And look, they're sitting in second throughout multiple stages this year. They're sitting in the top four, but just... The Bombers of old, eh? They just have another second half collapse of the season. Around a month or two in towards the season, the Bombers were actually ranked one of the top clearance sides in the competition. So their midfield was really standing up early on. And we're taking the boxes, banking those wins up until, oh, what well, round? Round 16, round 17 or somewhat. And then, yeah, unfortunately, the collapse for the Bombers fans did occur. Uh, but I'll take out a spot on prediction of 11th place. But... Yeah, I feel like Essendon, with uh, the progress they made this year, they're up in the top four. Surely they can push for the finals uh, next year, but I'll take that spot on prediction. Had them 11th and not finishing in 11th. In 10th place now, I'm going with the Gold Coast Suns again. Okay, so Gold Coast 10th place ended up finishing in 13th, so it is a three-point difference and just another same old season from the Suns. I think a lot of people were bullish on them, though, with uh, Damien Harwick at the helm, a, a pretty credible coach, of course, that uh, did coach one of the most successful teams of the 21st century of the Tigers. Um, was it going to be an instant impact? A lot of people thought. I felt probably not. That'd be another side just outside the top eight, but I'm pretty sure they did have one of their... In, in fact, no, they did actually have their most successful season in club history with the most amount of wins for a season. So there you go. They made a bit of progress uh, this year, the Suns. But... Yeah, just inconsistency killed them again. Uh, they started off the year pretty well, but uh, with some good performances, they also had some shocking performances. They were a very good side at home, at least. Noah Anderson and uh, Matty Ralph ended up finishing really well on the brand low. Sam Flanders thought he had an excellent year, too. Really solid move into the midfield. Played a little bit half-back, but I feel like his home is definitely um, a midfield position. Mac Andrew, he was able to show this year he can play either end of the ground at senior level. Had some big performances. Bodie Yulin loved his season as well. Collins, best and fairest winner too. Um, I feel like he was an All-Australian caliber key defender as well. So... It's a big season, though, for them next year. Damien Hardwick, you know, he's assessed the club. He's gone through and he's managed the club for the very first time. And now he's seen what needs to be done heading into next year. So it's a big year for the Suns, but still a bit of a mech mid-table finish for the club. So 13th, they ended up finishing, and I had them in 10th, so three-point difference. Someone's got to be here. I'm going with St. Kilda. Um, okay, so Saints said ninth place, and in the end they finished placing in 12th position, so it is a three-point difference, and yeah, very good second half of the year the Saints did have, they knocked off some very good sides like the Cats and also the Swans, both at least prelim finalists uh, in the end, and yeah, look, if I think if you look at the Saints though, they were for the most part, sitting in that bottom four, bottom six sort of range for the most of the season. But they had a lot of close losses. They had a, a lot of games where they really could have pitched and they could have finished, they could have finished, sorry, uh, a little bit higher. Uh, but with some of their positives this year, I thought that um, their ball movement, especially from the back half, was definitely a positive. I think they had actually were averaging the, the most amount of points from the back half this year. So, yeah, their ability to move the footy end to end, uh, definitely one of their strengths. Uh, but, yeah, geez, their midfield was highly inconsistent. Uh, there were multiple games this year where the midfield just got battered. But let's be real here. It just felt like the Saints did overachieve somewhat in 2023. So, including myself, a lot of people had them missing the eight. But I feel like they'd still challenge. Uh, but it really wasn't to be. They just left left their run, uh, their late charge, a little bit too late in the end, and they ended up finishing in 12th, so a three-point difference. Eighth place. The Geelong Football Club will return to the top eight. Okay, so the Cats in eighth place, and there you go. I'm pretty chuffed with that, to be fair, because, again, a lot of people had Geelong uh, missing the eight uh, once again in 2024. And, yeah, they just had a lot of doubt crept on them, given... Well, they missed finals in 2023, of course, and how will they go this year with the lack of exposure from, yeah, a lot of unknown young players, but geez, they just continue to prove a lot of people, including myself, wrong, uh, the Cats. I feel like they, they'd make finals and could win a final too. They ended up playing prelim final weekend, 
making the top four and we're a kick away from the grand final. And I could have won the flag, to be fair, given how poor Sydney's effort was in the grand final uh, in the end. Uh, but yeah, ended up having a really, really solid season. They started off the year like a house on fire. I think they were 6-0. and Had a bit of a slump in the middle of the year, but really got um, yeah, their brand going. I uh, thought they had some excellent performances across the span of this year. Some breakout players too. Uh, Lawson Humphreys, he was excellent in the second half of the year. But of course, Ollie Dempsey, rising star winner, had some pretty solid games across the wing too. The midfield was a little bit up and down as the season did wear on, but uh, Paddy Dangerfield really got the, turning, the screws turning uh, the right way around uh, with his impact in the second half of the year. Pretty solid final series from himself as well. And in the end, the Cats pushed all the way to a prelim, lost within a kick, and proved a lot of people wrong. So I'm happy I at least got the uh, the tip right for Geelong making finals. But yeah, geez, in the end, they ended up finishing in third place. So it is a five-point difference. Now in seventh place, and I'm going with Carlton. Now this is a bit of... Okay, so Carlton in seventh place. And yeah, happy with that prediction. Ended up finishing in eighth place. So very close from getting it spot on. Uh, just the point of the difference. And I did say in this uh, season predictions video, I just felt heading into this year, Carlton were... I just felt a bit overrated. Um, a lot of people had them in the top four, and I just felt, well, they'd sort of overachieved in a way to push to a prelim final. I had two very close wins in a row. And apart from their strong contested game, we all know about when we're talking about the Carlton Footy Club, I just didn't have the confidence that the rest of their game would be in good enough check to produce a consistent enough season to finish in the top four. And that certainly was the case. Uh, they were up and down a wee bit. They were looking pretty solid in the first half of the year, but similar to the Dons, they did fall off a wee bit. And to be fair, they had plenty of injury woes, but um, some of their defensive um, efforts, especially in the second half of the year, was what really let them down. But were still good enough to make finals. Uh, did get belted by Brisbane, to be fair. But this could be their season in the next year to really turn things around have a solid pre-season and get players fit in firing. But uh, yeah, pretty good prediction, I guess. Ended up finishing in eighth place and just a one-point difference. Sixth place, I'm going with Port Adelaide. Uh, okay, so Port Adelaide, sixth place. Pretty solid prediction. At least I had them in the finals. Uh, unlike a, there were a handful of people that had them miss the eight. Uh, ended up finishing in second position. And yeah, Port Adelaide could have finished absolutely anywhere with the final five rounds of the season to play. Um, yeah, they were looking like they're in danger of missing the eight. But uh, yeah, after the horror show against Brisbane, they were really able to get back onto the horse. They beat uh, the Swans by 112 points. They beat Western Bulldogs, who are in pretty solid form too. And uh, yeah, really got uh, yeah the most of their game in good order. I thought defensively, they were looking pretty sound. They were damaging with their contested stuff in the midfield. And for the ball, they were finding enough avenues to go. Uh, but it just came all crashing apart a wee bit in the finals. Got belted by 84 points against the Cats. We're able to rebound with one of their more stronger performances of the season against the Hawks and, yeah, really negate their strengths. But, yeah, end off the season in a disappointing note against the Swans. But, hey, a prelim finish, still pretty uh, a positive season, I guess, for Port Adelaide and proved probably a handful, people, uh, a handful of people wrong, like myself, I felt. They'll probably be around that 5 to 8 range, but in the end, another top four finish for Port. I had them sixth, so it is a four-point difference. Fifth place, I'm going with the Sydney Swans. Okay, so the Swans in fifth place and, yeah, ended up being the minor premiers. So it is a four-point difference. Uh, but, yeah, really bullish on the Swans heading into uh, season 2024. And to be fair, I just should have put them top four. In fact, I was really confident the Swannies would go and smash it this year. Uh, the recruits they made, Taylor Adams and also Brody Grundy and James Jordan, Joel Hamling, they had some really good ins and they were just decimated by injury. The Swans in 2023 still were able to be good enough to make the finals, and I felt I can't see them not improve heading into 2024, and that's exactly what they did. They started off, what, 13 or 12 and 1, and then they had a bit of a slump, as expected, like all sides do when you've started off a year so well. Uh, and then they were able to resurrect their season a wee bit, get bank enough wins to make the finals, get the two home finals, win them both, uh, but again, fall short in the, in the grand final. Geez, that was for sure another disappointment and a disappointing end to their season. Uh, but wow, they had some big uh, performance this year. Isaac Heaney, one of the best players in the competition, finally playing as a full midfielder. Good, another All-Australian for himself. Uh, I, I felt uh, Grundy's impact was really good uh, for the most part of the season too. And it was a pretty solid effort, to be fair, when they did have Callum Mills as their skipper uh, being out for the majority of the year. So ended up finishing in first place the Swans. Had them fifth, and geez, I just should have put them higher. Fourth place, I think that team will be the Adelaide Crows. As I said... Oh, dear me. Well, 
there's always blunders uh, when it comes to predictions, and there you go. I thought the Crows would make the top four. Um, yeah, I was leaning more and more into that bandwagon of thinking the Crows could push into the top four, and they just had such a promising season in 2023. They really should have made the finals and all that uh, dramas that did happen against the Swans late. But the high scoring team in 2023, they had a high octane forward line. They had a very efficient forward line too. Um, yeah, they had a midfield that certainly commanded respect with Dawson and Laird. It was pretty solid that year, but geez, it was the total opposite. Uh, they ended up having a very disappointing year, the Crows. And I felt what really did expose, what exposed the Crows was a bit of their um, administration and also just the lack of development of the young players. Look at Brisbane, for example. Their season was hanging by a thread. They debut Bruce Revel and Logan Morris and a few of those younger types. Kyle Lohman came into the side as well. And they ended up winning the flag. And I'm not saying the Crows were going to win the flag if they debuted their players early. But it's at least what they should have done. Because we saw Zach Taylor have some pretty good games the second half of the year. Uh, Hugh Bond and also Billy Dowling really uh, look like some good quality youngsters. But should have debuted them a little bit earlier. And um, yeah, the club was just really exposed this year. They didn't play a good enough brand of footy. Very inconsistent. They lost to the Tigers as well at home. They had a poor patch. Start of the year as well, they kicked like was it two or three goals literally against the Dockers away from home. So yeah, season to forget for Crow supporters, but they're going to be getting a handful of players like James Peatling and Isaac Cumming, and uh, I think another one is Neil Bullen too. So how will they go next year? Um, that's definitely going to be a big question for the Crows, but shocking call in the end. They ended up in the bottom four, so it's an 11-point difference. Place now, I've got the GWS Giants. I can't... Okay, back to a better top four position here. The Giants in third place ended up finishing the fourth, and yeah, they could have finished pretty much anywhere uh, in the top four. They, yeah, post buy had a little bit of a, a, a shaky run, but yeah, we're able to really get their brand going. Uh, in the back end of the season and ended up banking another top four finish. But geez, in the end, wow, did they choke. Really should have at least made a prelim final and went down embarrassingly uh, in straight sets. But not really much surprises here. We all expected the Giants to be another solid team in 2024. A lot of people had them for the flag. And yeah, it looked like a damaging side once again. Their pressure, uh, they were one of the best pressure sides uh, in the competition. Ball movement was a little bit inconsistent here and there, but it really got going uh, as the season did wear on too. Lockie Whitfield, outstanding and a consistent year. Finally, an injury-free season from himself, made another All-Australian. Toby Green, for his expectations, though, I felt like he uh, did lower his colours a little bit. Start the year, uh, quite sluggish. Uh, Tom Green, another solid year from himself, though he improved. Uh, but, geez, the star of the show was Jesse Hogan, Coleman medalist, and well done if you did get... Uh, that call right, I know Kados uh, did tip uh, Jesse Hogan for his Coleman medalist, so yeah, that's a good call from himself, but yeah, went bang and did win their best and fairest too. So yeah, the Giants ended up finishing their season eh, on a sour note, but still a top four finish, so that's something to hang their hat on. So just a one point difference, had them third, ended up finishing in fourth. So that now leaves the top two, which were the two grand finalists from last year. I can really either see Collingwood or Brisbane uh, be the minor premiers, but I'm gonna be going with Collingwood in second place. Okay, so the Pies in second, and we all know in first place is the Brisbane Lions. So yeah, Collingwood, uh, yeah. I think we've got to really just try and not get carried away because the sides won a flag that they can just easily make a top four. I always do it, and to be fair, we all always, uh, a lot of people do it, where the side wins the premiership and you just lock them in the top four the next year. Uh, but yeah, they ended up missing the finals, the Pies. It was, in the end, a, if I can look here, yep, seven-point difference, ended up finishing in ninth. Uh, start off the year really poorly, though. They looked sluggish. It looked like it was a classic premiership hangover. Uh, they were belted off the turnover. And a lot of early games, especially against the Swans, were able to start banking the wins as the season did go on, though. Uh, but yeah, had a lot of injuries. Jordan Nagawi wasn't able to produce a full consistent year. He was in and out of the side. Dan McStay coming back from an ACL. My check was also out for multiple stages this year, too. But also a big thing with the Pies this year is I just felt a lot of teams went to school on them. Where I did their homework on Collingwood because they were just such a... A really damaging side when the when they got the ball moving, especially in the forward half, and when they were able to move it from end to end. I felt a lot of teams were able to protect the corridor and just defend their ball movement well, and really cap, catch them off the turnover. Uh, so yeah, that's that's definitely a positive from teams being able to go to homework on the premiers uh, because you know when you when you're one of the hunters, you eventually become the hunted when you won the flag, and I think that was the case for the Pies this year. So yeah, 
probably uh, should not get too carried away in the future. But uh, yeah, went all the way with Collingwood thinking they could make another top four finish. But it wasn't to be as they missed the finals. So a seven point difference. I just can't see them drop off. They're going to be, again, a team that can definitely win the flag in 2024. Uh, and they're going to be my premiers for this season. Okay, so bang, the premiers I did get spot on. That's the first time in quite a while I've gotten uh, the premiers tip correct from the start of the year. The Brisbane Lions had them first, uh, but geez, the route towards the premiership success, premiership success was quite a bit different than what I thought it was uh, at the start of the year. Instead of me thinking that just blitz it, win every game at home once again like they did in 2023, term finals, in they go, grand final, and they'll win it. Uh, yeah, they start off really poorly and managed to uh, yeah, have an unbelievable turnaround. And geez, what a, what a resilient season it was from the Lions. It is a remarkable story. Uh, Chris Fagan was under the pump, and they started off, I think, 0-3. They were like 2-5. and 5. They were sitting in 13th almost, I think, halfway through the year. The draw against the Crows, they were playing some inconsistent footy. But, uh, yeah, like Dane Zorker and Lockie Neal, I felt a lot of those core players were able to really have so strong second half of the year. And as we said earlier, they did debut a lot of youngsters, and they just blooded them in as early as they could. Logan Morris and Kyle Lohman, outstanding season he had, because, because, uh, because since they debuted those youngsters early on, they turn out and have brilliant finals performances and stand up on the big stage. Lohman was awesome in the grand final. Uh, but yeah, a feel-good story, I felt, uh, for this season, um, given so many negatives that did happen early on in the year. Also, the Las Vegas saga. They come out, were down by 44 points against the Giants. They ended up winning that game, produced one of the great prelim final performances of all time and smashed the Swans by 10 goals in the grand final. It is a season like no other from the Brisbane Lions and were the premiers of the year. And ended up getting it totally spot on. So happy I got my premise call uh, correct, but still I had them in first. So it is a four point difference. Okay, so now the ladder prediction is reacted and fully gone over. So let's see what we do get when we add up all our scores. So let's remember 2022, 56 points. Last year, I'm pretty sure it was 82. I'm, I'm pretty sure. This year, we did get 68 points. So there we go. We improved off last year. And overall, I think that's pretty solid. I guess you can say we had a couple of blunders in there, like going with the Crows and also the Dogs and the Hawks. But we had some pretty good ones. Uh, at least the Cats did make finals. And if you had them, like the bottom six, you would have got, obviously, gained a lot of points off that. Um, and yeah, you know, Port Adelaide, Sydney, Giants, Brisbane, had a lot of teams making the eight. In the end, I got six out of the top eight correct in the end. Uh, and yeah, the Melbourne tip was also a pretty solid solid one too so a bit of good better bad but i think 68 not a bad score in the end okay so before we end today's video let's react to our bold calls so we did do eight bold calls back in february i'm pretty sure it was of how i think uh, the season would pan out with some big calls and we'll react to eight of them here so i've got the graphics up from when i did do them so the first bold call was geelong will either finish in the top eight or bottom four now that one is correct but isn't really a bold call. I should have done will either finish in the top four or bottom four. I would have still gotten that correct. But yeah, it should have been a little bit more bolder than that. Uh, but yeah, there was just a lot of doubts on the Cats heading into this year. How the youth go, how the veterans go. Uh, and it uh, ended up happening that Tom Hawkins did retire. And also the same with Zach Tui. But Cameron, all Australian season from himself. Dangerfield was strong in the second half of the year. Uh, they just gelled together so well as a team, uh, the Cats. They're a class side as always and, yeah, had some breakout players for some, from some youngsters. So I'll take that. They did either end up finishing in the top eight or bottom four, but I really should have put it as either the top four or the bottom four. Second bowl call, Melbourne will either finish finals in the, or finish uh, in the top four, sorry, or miss the finals. That one is correct because I've still felt at the start of the year Having the D's miss the top eight, uh, the top eight is still a pretty big call because, you know, there was still a lot of uh, people having them make the top four, and I think I do remember a few people had them for the flag as well when scanning across some uh, finals, uh, uh, sorry, season predictions earlier this year. Uh, and yeah, just as we said in the latter prediction segment, uh, they had injuries and they just couldn't really get their best out there. Petrarca going down uh, and the depth really get, get exposed a bit, uh, Melbourne. And yeah, their own strengths just got exposed. Uh, they couldn't really command enough respect in the contested game and the turnover game, just some average numbers there. So yeah, I wonder how they go next year, the Ds, but that is another tick. So two from two so far. Third bowl call, Jai Miss and Mitch Lewis will kick both over 55 goals. Mitch Lewis just once again injury prone, so cross there right away. Uh, but yeah, I was putting all my eggs in the Jai Miss basket, but um, I always did feel like uh, 
Of course, Josh Tracy was always a pretty underrated player, but yeah, he went bang this year. So aggressive in the air. He's sort of like that Charlie Kerno type where he's just such a damaging player overhead and had a very good year for the Dockers. So it wasn't just only Jai Miss, it also was Josh Tracy contributing towards uh, the Fremantle Act. And as for the Hawks, well, Cole Shadir, breakout year. Uh, Jack Gunson and Luke Bruce had some pretty decent games sprinkled in there. Uh, but yeah, Mitch Lewis, without their main spearhead, the Hawks still had a pretty, pretty solid year, but that bold call is wrong. For the fourth one, bang, here we go. The grand final will feature two non-Victorian sides. Hooray, one for the good guys. For the first time in 18 years, it did finally occur with the Swans and the Lions playing off in the grand final. Uh, unfortunately for my boys, couldn't get the job done, but it's always good to see a uh, non-Victorian team do get up, though, given it just doesn't really happen. The last 20 years before this year, the only two teams that have won it that aren't a Victorian team is the Swans and also West Coast. And finally, uh, Brisbane do join back into that circle. So bold, four, bold court four is correct. Number five, it's a Swans-themed one. Papley and Blakey to make the All-Australian and Adams for Rookie of the Year. Got a few of those right with the Blakey All-Australian, but Papley All-Australian incorrect. And Adams for Rookie of the Year, you just can't put them in the conversations. That is wrong, but Blakey did make his first All-Australian. Excellent year across halfback. Uh, was intercepting like a boss. Had a few mech games here and there. Uh, but yeah, his rebound is... Run and gun uh, abilities were uh, some of his, uh, yeah, just uh, very hard to, to coach against and very hard to play against when Blakey was off the chain. Papley did get injured, but uh, still was a heavy contributor with multiple games to the Swans this year. And Adams for the Rookie of the Year was really bullish on Adams to come in and make an impact. And to be fair, I did make these bold calls before Isaac Heaney was going to be playing as a full-time midfielder and had one of the seasons to remember. So, yeah, if I did have that judgment uh, if i did have that knowledge sorry i would probably change my judgment on adams for rookie of the year but hey he still played 20 games of the swans i felt he had some solid games but also some ordinary games but i uh, still feel like so far adams has been a pretty uh, good looking pickup for the swannies ball call number six north melbourne will finish above richmond i will definitely take that that is a ball call tip correct and just felt like this was going to happen and heading into this year i felt this was though a bold call given you look at Richmond, you look at North Melbourne, just simply on paper heading this year, the Tigers look like the better team and North Melbourne have been in the bottom four and trenched in the bottom four the last few years. But I feel like some changes would be made and things would happen. And yeah, the Tigers decimated by injury and end up being the wooden spoon as as for North Melbourne. They did finish in 17th, but still is a tip correct. But uh, yeah, I mean, either side could have finished a lot higher. They did have some close losses and yeah, the Tigers could have won a lot more than just two if they had a fully fit side for most of the year. Bowl call number seven, John Newcomb will be a top 10 player in the AFL. That one I'd say is incorrect. Um, but yeah, geez, he had a pretty solid final series. So can he bank off that and have, well, I could do this bowl call again next year. Could he be a top 10 player in the competition? Because yeah, there were some big signs uh, from him from the final series. But start off the year a bit slow, but really got going. And I felt for the Hawks, it wasn't just John Newcomb or Bust. They had a really even contribution of their midfield and they were one of the top ground level uh, sides in the competition. Will Day, when he came back in, made an instant impact and Warple had some big games this season too. So, yeah, it's more of a collaborative effort in the midfield, I think, for the Hawks when you look at it. But, uh, yeah, it could, he, he could still go to the next level next year. Newcomb had a really promising final series. And the final bowl call, it was Adelaide will go undefeated at home. We'll pretend we didn't see that one. Um, okay. Anyways, thanks very much for tuning in, everybody. Yeah, it's always a fun video to go over and react to my predictions. So, um, yeah, if you lot did any predictions at the start of the year, feel free to comment down below uh, with some of your big calls you did get right and some of your absolute blunders because it, it always happens. We have some blunders, but we have some beauties at the same time. I really appreciate the support with this season, everybody. We'll, of course, be getting into the off-season content and, you know, the talking footy types of videos I always love doing. Trade period does start soon, so keen for that as well. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it from me, everybody. Hopefully you did go and to enjoy today's video. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you did. And until next time, I'll talk to you later. See you later, guys.